All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started here. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another TRA uh, educational webinar. I'm one of your co-hosts, Joe Monastero, Chief Operating Officer of the Texas Restaurant Association. I am Ben Nora. I am the Partner and Sponsorship Development Manager. Nice to have everyone today. Thank you for being with us. And with us today, we have uh, Dan Spears from BMI, who's going to be walking us through kind of the uh, what's what in the world of music licensing. Uh, and then a face I know many of you are familiar with, Peter Miller, our uh, board treasurer and owner of County Line Barbecue. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Joe. So, Dan, we'll turn it over to you uh, and, and walk us through your, your presentation. Uh, just a couple of uh, hints for those in the audience uh, who haven't been on the webinar with us before. We have two different ways that you can communicate with us. You can send a question in the chat or you can use the Q&A option and then we will get to questions and answers uh, after Dan walks us through this overview on what you need to know about music licensing and your restaurant. So take it away, Dan. Thank you, Joe and Ben and, and Skeeter. Um, first of all, you know, we have a great relationships with, with the TRA. It's, it's one of our more valued partnerships. So um, I, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be with you all today and, uh, and share some of my insight uh, in the music licensing industry. Just a little background on me. I've been with BMI for um, going on 34 years. So um, I hope that you'll find this presentation valuable, not just from a BMI perspective, but kind of a global look at music licensing. This is not going to be a an advertisement for BMI. This is going to be hopefully a primer on what you need to know about music licensing and the respective performing rights organizations. And of course, at the end, we'll have plenty of time for questions if I don't cover everything that, that you're hoping that I will in this presentation. Um, any BMI representative worth his salt would never start a presentation without a little music. So um, that's how we're kicking things off. As you should. Okay, so other than trying to infuse a little energy into a Wednesday afternoon, there was a practical reason for this. Um, and that is most, you know, most music users, most businesses, most, most of the general public, you know, feel like the music they hear on the radio, most of the time, the songs were written by the artists themselves. But in reality, a lot of the music um, that you're featuring in your respective establishments um, was written by some anonymous songwriters, particularly in the country genre. There's a songwriting community in Nashville with a bunch of folks you've never heard of that crank out songs on a daily basis, hoping to get a major country artist to record it, hoping it will be released as a single, hoping that we'll get on the charts um, so that they can be compensated for that. Um, that song, Twist and Shout, was covered by all those various artists, but written by none of them written by two folks you've probably never heard of, Phil Medley and Burt Russell. So um, that just kind of kicks things off with um, kind of the foundation for what we're gonna be going through. And that is uh, talking about the public performance right and, and the fact that songwriters make a living based upon that and, and based upon the royalties they receive from BMI and the other performing rights organizations 
that ultimately come to BMI through licensing fees paid by establishments like yours. So in this uh, next 20 minutes or so, we're going to talk about the various aspects of the music copyright uh, bundle and um, specifically focus on, on the one that is most relevant and meaningful to a business owner. We're going to talk about what is licensable from a music standpoint in your business. This, I think, is the most important part of the presentation because it's really how uh, Joe and I decided this was a good idea uh, because people are getting uh outreach from a variety of different organizations with a variety of different acronyms not knowing if they're legitimate or not so we're going to go through all the performing rights organizations talk a little bit how they're structured um, and give you some insight and how to deal with them when you do get a phone call or an email from from one of those organizations we call them performing rights organizations and i'll get more into that in a few minutes um, also going to talk a little bit about a partnership that we have um, with an online booking company that might make your live music booking process easier. And of course, we'll talk about the great discount program we've had with the TRA for many years. First, just some insight, some perspective on all the rights that are part of the bundle of music copyrights. Uh, we're going to start from the bottom, move up to the top. The synchronization license, synchronization rights is held by the songwriter and the publisher. What's a publisher? A publisher almost serves as an agent on behalf of a song. Um, it's different from a book publisher in the sense that publishing companies hold the copyrights to songs. They will uh, hire staff writers um, that they hope will write songs that will ultimately be recorded and put into a television show or a movie or recorded by an artist and put on the radio. Um, and so that publisher uh, and the songwriter um, own what's called the synchronization right. And that's when uh, a producer wants to use a song in a television show uh, or a movie or an advertisement on the radio or television. They must go to the publisher and ask for the rights to that song and negotiate a fee. It's a negotiated fee. Um, and I mention it because it does represent a small piece of the income that songwriters receive on an annual basis, but that's assuming that their music gets into a television show or a movie, which is not easy to do. Uh, then there's the mechanical royalty, and that's when a, a song is digitally downloaded or perhaps it's sold uh, as a physical copy. Uh, vinyl is coming back a little bit, CDs as well. And when those are sold, the songwriter and the publisher split a very small piece of that. So those are very small incomes to a songwriter. Where a songwriter gets most of its income is through this public performance right. Uh, it's when a piece of music is played in public, in a business, um, whether it's a radio station, a television station, a bar, a restaurant, a fitness center, your favorite yoga class, uh, Spotify. Uh, Any time music is played publicly, then the songwriter and publisher are, to, are entitled to um, a royalty um, for that. Now, what BMI does is basically represents the public performance of music. Um, as a songwriter, you affiliate with a company like BMI. We go out and license businesses that use your music and then turn around and um, collect licensing fees and pay royalties to the songwriters based upon the performances of their catalog. Um, and as I said, it, it covers music played in a variety of different venues and forms of media. Now, what is licensable? What is considered part of the public performance? Um, and by the way, the public performance um, would not include um, if you had a wedding uh, at, your, at your bar or a hotel, um, or you were having a party at your house, you were having a private party and you invited a, a cover band to come play in your backyard. Those are considered private performances. It would not be subject to the copyright law. So what's licensable? Well, the radio can be. If you have a, a large establishment and you got your favorite Austin radio station booming into your uh, into your restaurant or bar, um, even though the radio station has a license with BMI or the other performing rights organizations, it does not cover what we call that second performance that comes into your business. There is an exemption under the copyright law. Um, I believe it's something around 3,000 square feet or less. A business is not subject to it. Um, live music, of course, is one of the major triggers of a public performance. If you have a DJ, karaoke, all forms of public performance. 
Television sets, one of the most confusing. One of the things that most businesses push back on. Um, when the audio is turned on in a television set in a sports bar or a restaurant, believe it or not, that's the responsibility of the business itself to license. So when you work with DirecTV or your local cable company to get the commercial rights to have that television uh, video in your respective establishment, you don't get the audio with it. The copyright law specifically says if the audio is turned on, any music that comes out of that audio stream is the responsibility of the business itself. The way to avoid that, if the only thing you have musically in your business is any audio coming out of your television set, turn the audio off. But as long as you use audio, you're responsible for whatever comes out, whether it's music and commercials, halftime show music, um, what have you. Now, here is um, an area that you are not responsible for when it comes to licensing. If you're a restaurant or a bar and all you have music wise in your establishment is a commercial music service, Pandora for Business, Rockbot, Soundtrack, your brand, Mood Media. Um, you are not responsible for licensing that because those background music services uh, are doing that on your behalf. They are licensing with the major performing rights organizations, uh, so you are not responsible for that. Now, if you were to take your own personal Pandora account or your own personal Spotify account, create a playlist, and stream that into your establishment, that would be a responsibility. Only the commercial music, uh, music services are covered. And they also have a very narrow license with BMI, ASCAP and CSAC and such. It's only for ambient music. So if you had mood media and you had on an EDM channel and you, everybody was dancing to that and it was very interactive or you're using it for trivia, that's not covered in the license. You'd have to get a separate agreement with the performing rights organizations uh, in order to allow for that interactive use. talked about yes this slide you're absolutely about to go where i wanted to make sure we mentioned because um you you were, you were showing pandora for business there just a minute ago and now you brought in all the personal ones so um i think what's really important for everyone to understand is where where do those lines cross on you know even if i've got it on my corporate card and i'm paying for it by my business and i've got it on my business email apple spotify google play commercial or, or consumer pandora that doesn't mean I'm covered, does it? Yeah, it's just the nature of, I mean, did you proactively obtain, uh, you know, Spotify for business, Pandora for business? If you did, you're covered. If you didn't and you just are using your own subscription, you would need to license that. It's, it's very similar to a television set, right? I mean, if you own a personal television set and you erect it in your business, um, you can't have that TV on showing games and other things without... Uh, securing the proper licenses for that. It's the same thing with the music. You can't um, just simply put your own personal account out there, uh, Spotify. You can, but you'd have to license that. The bar, the restaurant would have to have that agreement with BMI and ASCAP and such. That's perfect. I'm just going to jump in real quick. Um, I see a couple of people have raised their hand. Um, okay, sure. No, we, don't have to wait. Uh, we, don't have to, we don't have to wait to the end. That's fine. Yep, but what we do want to do so that we're not having to promote and unpromote people throughout the webinar is do please type in your questions either in the chat or in the Q&A, and then we'll go ahead and read them out to Dan to uh, answer. So uh, instead of raising your hand, please just go ahead and uh, type that into the chat would be most appreciated. Okay, so before I get to the various players in this space other than BMI, um, I just want to give people some insight into how the kind of circle of life occurs in that music ecosystem. So a songwriter, Joe, for example, let's say he suddenly finds this talent for writing songs. Um, he would affiliate with BMI, which by the way is free, and he would give BMI permission to represent um, the catalog of music that he has written. Uh, the publisher does the same thing. The publisher has a catalog of music written by the songwriters affiliated with that publisher, and they affiliate uh, with BMI as well. Some songwriters don't have publishing deals. They've, they publish the music themselves, and so they don't share the royalties with a publisher. But um, any royalty that is, is, is paid out to the songwriter and publisher is split 50-50. So a songwriter joins BMI or any of the other performing rights organizations. 
We track those performances on radio, TV, film. We license all the businesses that are using that music. We collect those fees. And then based upon those performances that we're tracking, we're paying the royalties out to the songwriters, publishers, and composers on a quarterly basis. Now, here are the other organizations that do what we do. And so if you'll just indulge me for a minute, I'm going to get into a little bit of detail here because I think it's really important how they operate so that when you get a phone call from one of these companies uh, that all refer to themselves using acronyms, that you will have an understanding of them to the point where you'll have some strength in knowledge and be able to operate from a position of knowing how they work so that you won't feel like you're being taken advantage of. Because it is a, it is a, a complex, confusing business. And most of the time, owners don't really understand who the different players are and don't know what their respective rights are with those companies. So ASCAP, we start there because they were the very first performing rights organization uh, in this country, founded in uh, the early 1900s. Um, they are owned and operated and governed by the members themselves, which are publishers and songwriters. They operate in a not-for-profit way. They have, I think, probably up to 800,000 members now. And just like BMI, the royalties are paid on a quarterly basis. So ASCAP was the first, first game in town. When radio first came on the scene, um, there was a need for an organization to represent those songwriter rights. BMI was the next one to come along in the late 1930s. We are also operate as a not-for-profit company. Um, we are owned and operated. Well, I shouldn't say operated. We are owned and run by a board made up of broadcasters. And I'll tell you why. In 1939, ASCAP was the only performing rights organization that was representing songwriters. In 1930s, like most of the music you heard on the radio was traditional music, George Gershwin and Stephen Foster, what have you. ASCAP had a very strict requirement on who could join their society. You must have had at least two established hits on the radio to be a member of ASCAP. That was the eligibility requirement. Well, in the 1930s, suddenly this new wave of music started coming to the U.S. from Appalachia, right? If you ever watched uh, the, the, the uh, public television um, documentary that Ken Burns did about country music, you learned about Appalachian music. That was the beginning of country music. They referred to it as hillbilly music. Well, that music started coming on the scene and they were looking for vehicles with which they could have their music performed to a large audience like radio, via radio. Well, uh, radio wouldn't play it because there was no copyright compliance mechanism. ASCAP wouldn't affiliate them be with, uh, because there, was, uh, no two there were no two established hits on the radio by those songwriters. Um, and so BMI was created to open the door to those new forms of music. Also on the scene at that time, race music, which of course later became R&B and the early stages of rock and roll. Um, so BMI was created to open the door to new forms of music, and also because ASCAP was a monopoly at the time, obviously when it's a monopoly, the fees are going up um, by 100% every year. So the broadcasters were the ones having to pay that. So the radio industry got together, sold shares of stock to create the seed money, to create BMI as competition to ASCAP and to bring no, new forms of music on the scene. So that's very important to understand uh, how these companies came about. What's even more important than that is they both operate under Justice Department consent decrees. So in the 1960s, the Justice Department was concerned that there weren't many of these performing rights organizations in the space. And so they put strict sort of um, control over how we do business. Most of the stuff wouldn't be relevant to, to the business owner on this call, but what's very relevant is a clause in there that says we must treat similarly situated businesses in a similar fashion. And that means we create standard agreements for all the industries that we work with. In this case, the restaurant industry and the bar industry have one agreement, both ASCAP and BMI have our own separate ones. They're similar in terms of how they're structured, but we both operate under consent decrees, which means when ASCAP calls you up and says, 
here's the rate, here's what it's based upon, here's the formula we're using. That's the same formula, that's the same rate that every restaurant in America is, is using in determining what their fee is. And we are prohibited by law from negotiating separate deals with separate restaurants or bars or hotels or radio stations or what have you. It's very important to understand that. Now, that's not true for this company, CSAC, a for-profit company founded in the 1930s for a long, long time at a very small catalog made up of religious music, a little bit of country. And then, I don't know, in early 2000s, something like that, uh, they were bought out and the owners decided they wanted to really heighten the profile of CSAC and they started signing some pretty big um, songwriters. Uh, they are now owned by a venture capital firm. They are privately held. They are for profit. You can negotiate with CSAC. So if CSAC comes to you and offers you a rate that sounds like it's not commensurate with the kind of with the amount of music you're playing that's from their catalog, you can push back and you negotiate. Now, just to give you an idea of who, who really has the market share, and that's important to know as well, you know, BMI, uh, you know, traditionally BMI and ASCAP have certainly been the largest performing rights organizations. You know, I, I, our, our catalog is probably 50, you know, one or 2%, you know, depending upon, um, you know, what month we're providing that information to you. And ASCAP is a little less than that, but BMI and ASCAP represent the lion's share of the music that you're playing in your bars and restaurants. CSAC, probably, you know, two or 3% uh, of the music out there, but they have some very high profile songwriters um, that, so you have to do business with them. It's very, very difficult to not play CSAC music. But my point in telling you this is that if, if BMI's rate is $500 a year, ASCAP's is you know, $450 a year, and CSAC comes in with a rate that's $500 a year, you need to push back because their catalog is much smaller than BMI's, and you should never be paying the same amount to CSAC that you're paying to BMI and ASCAP. And that would go along as well with global music rights. So global music rights, the most uh, recent uh, entry onto the... Uh, music licensing public performance scene. Um, they were founded by Irving Azoff um, uh, back in 2013. Many of you might know who Irving Azoff is. Uh, he was uh, the longtime manager of the Eagles, very successful music executive. He decided that he wanted to create a, a repertoire written by a roster of songwriters that no business could do without. And he said, I'm gonna price, I'm gonna price it that way. I'm gonna charge uh, fees commensurate with the high visibility that our songwriters bring to the table and their catalogs as well. So Bruce Springsteen came over from ASCAP, Bruno Mars came over, Pharrell Williams. He built up a catalog uh, that's not very big, but the songwriters that are in that catalog uh, and their works that are represented are, are pretty popular. And again, a company you probably have a difficult time getting away from performing. But again, like CSAC, they are, they, are, they are very small when you compare their catalogs to BMI and ASCAP, a couple percentages of the marketplace. So again, if BMI is charging 500 and global music rights comes in very aggressively, which they do, um, and they say, yeah, pay us 500, you need to push back because it's not commensurate with their catalog. Now, having said all that, CSAC and Global Music Rights do exactly what BMI and ASCAP do. They protect the rights of songwriters and publishers. So we obviously endorse and believe in their mission, but we also feel it's important for everybody to pay a fair rate. Um, and, and that's just my, that's, that's, that's my word of caution is don't accept their fees right away if, you, if they look a little different and funky compared to BMI and ASCAP in terms of, 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 of what they're charging. Hey, Dan, can you go back a yeah. second? To yeah. that? It's a great slide for us just to pause on for a moment. Sure, um, absolutely. There, there's more than a few people um, in the audience and, and obviously the four of us to discuss this, doing this webinar kind of predicated on um, the, the pop-up of global music rights, doing a little bit more uh, farming in the Texas area of, of getting license fees and things. And, and we've got a couple of really good questions and it all really ties to, yeah. You know, this is the landscape, right, of, of music licensing. So. If you just reiterate, because um, you, you mentioned this at the beginning of the webinar, um, the 3,000 square foot benchmark um, and, and exactly 
how that works so that you know, the, the, the exemption for under 3,000 square feet is crystal clear. It's only for a commercial radio station signal. Has nothing to do with live music or karaoke or any of those other forms of public performance. It's only if you have a commercial radio station that you are broadcasting into your restaurant or bar. Um, there is a exemption. It's uh, you know, I could share that with you um, and you can distribute it. It's it's something like I always forget. It's something like 3000 square feet or less. Uh, it's de retail establishments are a little bit. It's a little bit lower than that. But uh, it's only I, I want to make sure that I, I, I emphasize this point. It only is if it's a commercial radio station. It's not right. connected to any other forms of public performance, live music. Yeah, and that's an important distinction when we're talking about the different ways in which you might bring music into your restaurant. Um, we, we obviously have Skeeter Miller on the line with us as well. Um, and with county line uh, and, and state line out in El Paso, there's sometimes uh, live music. They have private events and everything. So I'd love to have Skeeter weigh in on, on this landscape. And, and I know you had a question as well, Skeeter. Yeah, I did. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we have uh, numerous private events. A lot of times uh, it's a wedding or it's a group and they want to come in and they want to they want to play uh, Bluetooth, their Pandora songs that they have you know, through your speakers in your private event area, how, do, where, where do we land on that? No problem. That's a private performance. Okay. Okay. It's a private performance. When you're inviting the public into that environment, then it would be your responsibility. But if it's a private performance and they have a wedding band there, or as you say, they have their own Spotify playlist, uh, it's not a problem. That's a private, that's a private show. Okay. All right. Thanks for clarifying that for me. So Dan, can you just for a second while we're looking at you know, the four of these, and I think you made a very valid point in ASCAP and BMI really being the long held nonprofit organizations. Clearly, we've had a very long standing preferred partner relationship with BMI and extended that discount onto our partners uh, and members. I know you're going to talk about that in a minute, but there is such a difference in, in just the, the size of representation, even though Global Music Rights might have some of the bigger, more well known names. Um, speak a little bit to like, how is it decided? what a, a business should pay and and you know without revealing who this was but part of the reason we got to the point of having this webinar was uh, a member reached out to us about global music rights having sent them and very arbitrary first time received invoice for about eight thousand um, dollars and they do not pay anywhere near that amount to bmi or ascap uh, the venue has both piped in music as well as live music um, and so if, if i'm the average restaurant owner, um, and, and ironically enough, I, I lived most of my life knowing BMI and ASCAP from our restaurant in Chicago and, and would get those invoices and have the pleasure of dealing with them myself. So it, it, it was understandable when I would read that invoice where it was coming from for our dining room, not our private events from ASCAP and BMI. But how does a company like Global Music Rights just you know come up with an $8,000 number and, and ship that invoice off to an operator? Great. It's a great question. I, I, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> but, but, but again, what I, what I can tell you is uh, this is about providing you with information and knowledge so that you can be better equipped to respond to something like that when Global Music Rights sends you a bill for $8,000 for a license and you're paying BMI, you know, $1,000 a year. Um, you know, what I, what I would say to Global Music Rights, if I were a business owner, I'd say, look, I know BMI represents 50% plus of the music that I have in my venue. I just know it because it's, it's common knowledge that BMI and ASCAP um, have the largest catalogs in the space. And I know that Global Music Rights, their, their percentage of, of the music that's played out there uh, in, the, in the industry, in the marketplace, is you know, in a, you know, two or three or four percent, what have you. Um, so... Mr. Global Music Rights representative, I am, I'm just saying to you, um, I want to pay something that's commensurate with what your catalog is and what's being performed in my venue. And if I'm paying BMI a thousand a year and they have 50% plus uh, market share and your Global Music Rights and you have 3% market share, why is it that you're charging $8,000 and I'm paying BMI $1,000? It's just having that kind of practical conversation with them. And my experience has been, and again, I, I can't speak for global music rights. I mean, they're, they're doing what we do. They're trying to represent their songwriters to the best 
to their of their ability, but it needs to be fair. And and you know we're we're under a consent decree, so we're tightly scrutinized. They are not, so they can throw something against the wall and see what happens. They got into a huge legal fight with the radio industry, um, counter suits back and forth because they were very aggressive in their pricing model. And BMI, excuse me, and uh, the, what's called the Radio Music Licensing Committee uh, fought back, and it was a it was an ugly, ugly battle. So um, I don't know, Joe. I think they're trying to establish what they think they can get by. Again, this is just me. I I, I have no inside information, but I suspect they're just saying, hey, you know, here's what we're going to charge. Let's see if we can set a bar based upon who's going to accept that. I don't I don't know. But I do know that you can negotiate. I know that they're not prohibited by law from negotiating. So you should negotiate with them. And by the way, you should not ignore them. They are legitimate. They, they represent a legitimate catalog of music that you probably are going to be having played in your venue at some point during the course of a week. And so don't ignore them because they will. They, they could get litigious. They could send cease and desists. So you have to you have to engage with them. But I would I, I would to, to qualify that with engage with them to get to the either fair amount owed yeah. or to prove to them, you know, if, if if I had still open today our 55-year-old Italian restaurant that played classical Neapolitan instrumental music straight out of Italy. It's unlikely that the artists were on global music rights list. So my conversation with them is going to be, I don't play Bruno Mars. I don't play any of the Eagles music. If I have none of the artists that are, are you know, on your representative list, why should I be paying you music license rights? And this ties to a question that was submitted by uh, Brian Potts that I think everybody ultimately would love to know. And, and if you wouldn't mind peeling the curtain back a little bit, if it's a live show, you know, if we go to, state line to see Kyle Parks perform, then obviously that's a very different situation because Skeeter's negotiating with you guys on having Kyle Park come and perform, right? And, and the, the performance fee is going to have that, that license fee in there too. But when it's piped in music and we're having, you know, whether it's Pandora for business or, or a personal account, or it's a playlist or whatever curated music that's being piped in. So fine, now we're, we're paying you guys how does that get sent back? The, the way that Brian phrased the question is like, you know, restaurants never report back what was played in the restaurant. So how does that money then get to the right songwriters? Or is it sort of like you're in a collective and based upon the popularity of your music, you're getting kind of a percentage at the end of each quarter of the likelihood that your music was played in various restaurants? Can you give me a couple slides? Absolutely. I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. It's 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 absolutely a, a legitimate question. And, and I'm going to get there in just a second. Um, and by the way, your example about Kyle Park, it's a good one. So when Skeeter brings in Kyle Park, he's paying Kyle Park as an artist, as a band, as a musician. When he pays BMI, of which Kyle Park, by the way, is a BMI songwriter, he's paying Kyle Park as a songwriter as part of his BMI licensing fee. When he pays him to come in and do a gig, that's compensating him for his actual show. Um, your example about the Neapolitan music, I mean, we do have relationships with international societies, uh, Italy being one of them. These are a variety of others. SOCAN is out of Canada. These are all just examples of countries uh, that have performing rights organizations that BMI has reciprocal agreements with, which means if you're playing you know, Japanese karaoke music, um, you're covered and your BMI license, even though that music uh, is represented by a different society. We have a reciprocal agreement with them where we collect on their behalf in the United States. And when Joe writes a song, that's the number one, you know, number one uh, tune in, uh, in Tokyo. Um, we're, uh, the, the Japanese Performing Rights Organization is collecting those licensing fees from the businesses that use the music and then paying BMI. And then we're paying, we're paying Joe. And by the um, way, credit due where we're, we're credit due for your team. Back in the day when you know, my father and uncle were yelling, go get this taken care of and get it gone. I don't want to pay this. Your team did walk us through the international aspect of BMI. And we accepted it. Like, great. In our Italian restaurant, we're playing this music. It, songwriters are being represented. So we'll happily pay our BMI bill. Yeah. Well, I appreciate hearing that. 
So we don't make any money from the music licensing fees. BMI, as I said before, operates in a not-for-profit fashion. 90 cents of every dollar we collect goes back to the songwriters, composers, and publishers so they can continue to write songs and make a living doing so. I think this is the most important slide from my perspective because so many businesses that pay licensing fees to BMI, um, they're not happy about it. They look at it like sometimes they feel like it's extortion. Sometimes they feel like, you know, we're the music mafia coming in to break kneecaps. <laughs> And sometimes that's because we're fairly aggressive in trying to get the licensing fees in and the contracts in on behalf of our songwriters. But understand that when you pay BMI, you are supporting the creative community. You're helping songwriters continue to write music because of, of the fact that the lion's share of that licensing fee goes back to the songwriter. Now, that takes me to, well, let, me, let me go back. Um, so how are the, how are the royalties determined how are, how are the performances tracked in a bar or restaurant so technology is getting advanced we're not quite there yet to track on a one-to-one -one basis when uh you know a, a randy bachman song from the guess who is played in a in a bar on a saturday afternoon um is he getting a, you know that fee paid directly to him because of that um no what happens is, is that all the money that we collect from the restaurant and bar industry goes into the same pot of money that's collected from the radio industry. And we have uh, the Shazam technology, whereby we have listening stations in all of the major radio markets where we collect all that performance data, because of course, you know, Shazam can recognize the digital footprint in a song. So we get very accurate information. And the general feeling is that if a song is being played in a bar or a restaurant, it's probably reflective of what's being played on the radio. There's a lot of different genres and formats on radio, right? There's hot AC, there's pop, there's classic rock. And the feeling is that the bar and restaurants pretty much mirror what, what the public is listening to on radio. So that pot of money that the bar owners and restaurant owners pay into is paid out based upon that radio performance data with one exception. And it's later in my presentation, but I'll talk about it now. If you have a regional artist, a regional songwriter, a local singer songwriter that you have coming in on Thursday nights and they play primarily original songs and they happen to be a member of uh, BMI or even ASCAP and CSAC because they have similar programs, that local singer songwriter uploads their original uh, playlist to BMI and we pay them based upon the original works that are performed in that bar or restaurant so that that bar owner and restaurant owner knows that by paying BMI, they're in turn supporting the career of that songwriter in addition to whatever they're being paid by the bar to perform that night. If they're getting paid 200 bucks to play from you know 6 to 8 p.m., um, a portion of their licensing fees are also going to compensate that local singer songwriter. And I mentioned this um, a lot in my presentations because sometimes the local singer songwriter that's affiliated with BMI doesn't have any idea this program exists. It's called BMI Live. It's later on in the presentation. We'll skip through it. Um, but it's important for bar owners and restaurant owners to make sure that their performers know about it because that's how they're insured, to your point, Joe, that the fees they're paying go to the right people. So before you jump forward, something yeah. very relevant and, and to what you were just talking about, um, you know, we had classical Italian playing in our restaurant. Skeeter has country artists that come into his. Uh, one of our members from the Dallas area, they only play jazz. Where can a restaurateur go when they're interacting with the four major organizations to see the who and or which songs are part of the catalog? Yeah, so B <clears throat> it's a good segue into, so BMI and ASCAP a few years ago, um, because the market requested it, created a major database that basically gives you information on almost any song that you're interested in, who represents it, what, what organization is the songwriter affiliated with, who is it published by, contact information, all of that. Now, CSAC and GMR, their catalogs haven't quite yet been meshed into that, but the, the, the database is massive. It's called SongView and can be accessed very simply on bmi.com. It's a very searchable, uh, user-friendly database. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty hard 
to, I, I've mentioned this before, but it's pretty hard to manage your music to the point where you only have to take a license with BMI or ASCAP or CSAC um, because so much collaboration goes on, particularly in the country genre, particularly in the hip hop R&B world. There's could be three or four songwriters connected to one composition. And so you have an ASCAP license and not a BMI one, well, then that would prohibit you from playing some of those collaboration songs. So, um, but to your point, if you want to know what you're paying for and you, and you really want to get a sense of, um, of what BMI represents, what ASCAP represents, go to BMI.com and there's a song view database there that's very searchable. And Ben, just uh, drop that into the chat for everybody so you yeah. can uh, go ahead and copy that direct link rather than having to search for it. Yep. And I'm told CSAC, you know, CSAC's database is searchable online as well. I don't, I don't know if GMR has gotten there yet or not. Um, but I always, in any case, if GMR is not available, you ask for it, right? You want to know what you're paying for. You know, you don't, shouldn't just blindly sign a license without knowing what it is that you're getting for it. Um, because sometimes, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, people just blindly sign licenses because they don't understand and they're and they blindly pay a licensing fee without really understanding um, who the organization is that's billing them they just know they, they got scared because there's a couple lines in there that say you'll be sued for copyright infringement and understandably you know bars and restaurants are in the business of serving food and beverages uh, and they don't have time to manage all this music stuff so um, I'm hoping that this is going to give you arm you with a little more information uh, very quickly, you know, for those that have not ever had a license agreement with BMI and you're thinking about implementing live music at your restaurant, our fees are based upon your occupancy, uh, your fire code number, because that's a very trackable number. And then the fee is, is the, the rate is connected to a plethora of, of different music uses that we have on our report form. Do I have karaoke or do I have live music? Do I have recorded music and all those things? Um, when added together with the occupancy uh, rate is what gets you to your ultimate number. Um, this is the BMI Live page I was talking about for any of you local singer-songwriters that come in and perform at the venues that, that um, you want to make sure they get paid, just tell them, go to BMI Live. And every night after they perform, upload that set list to BMI. And these guys can make several thousand dollars a year. I mean, it's not huge money, but it's gas money. And when you're a struggling artist, it, it, it matters. Um, very briefly, for anybody that's thinking about live music or currently has live music and has lost their booker because of staffing issues, which of course we know are very real. We know how, how much impact the last few years has had on the restaurant industry and how devastating it's been. And so in, in, the, in the midst of all of that at BMI, we were thinking, what can we do to help uh, the industry recover? What can we do to help make life easier? And so we forged a partnership with a company called Gigmore. Uh, Gigmore is an online uh, music booking um, organization. Um, we vetted them. They're very good at what they do. They have a very large artist database. So in just about any city in America, you can go on there and see what artists are available in your market, uh, what genre, most every genre is represented. And it's an easy way to to book artists locally if you're having trouble tapping into the local uh, music scene. So they basically, they connect the venues to performing artists. Um, and, you know, you can negotiate a rate with that artist uh, for, for what you would pay them to perform. Um, it's, it's very user-friendly. And again, we wanted to partner with, with an organization that we were confident would deliver so we could recommend to our customers and our association partners this is a good organization if you have any of your members that are interested in, in starting live music programs and don't know where to begin. As we've referenced a couple of times in this conversation, we have a great, great relationship with the Texas Restaurant Association. Uh, the foundation for that relationship is our association discount program where you can save up to 20%. It's only for restaurants um, and, and bars. It's not, I make the distinction, it's not for hotels. Um, and it's 10%, it's 5% um, uh, for being a member, 5% for paying online or over the phone, and then, five, and then another 10% for paying upfront in advance. So you can receive up to a 20% discount. 
And we love our relationship with the TRA because we, we always partner together on some very cool events with our songwriters participating and whether it's the Lone Star Bash or, or other really unique, interesting things that you do as an association. Clearly one of the greatest associations out there in the marketplace. I know because I spend a lot of time with them. So I'm not just blowing smoke for this call. It's um, they're great. They're, you know, you, they obviously provide great service to their members, but they also provide great service to their partners. And um, for us, that's important. We want to be able to do what we're doing now and that's educate and, and and take an opportunity to thank anybody on this call that pays BMI licensing fees and has never felt any love from BMI. Trust me, we appreciate everything that you do to support songwriters and understand that when you do pay those fees, I promise you they're going to songwriters. They're not going into some lawyer's pocket into a deep black hole. Perfect. And now questions. Yeah, a lot of questions. We've got Skeeter on the call. I do want to take a second to, uh, Thank Dan. I've got to go write the license check for his PR of the TRA. Get that, <laughs> get that into BMI. Um, but yeah, truly of our preferred partners, you guys have always been a great collaborator. Yes, uh, the music that we have at Lone Star Bash every year is provided by BMI. And so uh, we, we do appreciate that you've taken time to kind of pull back the curtain. While the curtain's pulled back on the mysteries of licenses, we do have some questions. But I first want to bring Skeeter on to talk a little bit about the the operator's perspective on this. Uh, we've talked a little bit about it through through the call, but um, you know, to your point, Dan, you're out there trying to fight for the songwriters and get them their fee, but it does sometimes become a thorn in our sides. And so oh. I want to give Skeeter a chance yeah. to talk a little bit about his perspective. Yeah, Dan, really, really appreciate your time. I, you you did clear up quite a few things for me and, and our group. Uh, we have a we do a music series at three of our restaurants. Uh, you know, every year. Uh, it lasts sometimes for 15 weeks or less, depending on what weather's like. It changes. They're only there once a week. I realize that, you know, your billing is based on, you know, seats. And but how, how, how do we know we're not being overcharged for, I mean, that we're not doing music every day of the week? How do you know? How do you, how do you verify that, that you understand that we're only doing it, you know, once a week? It's a charitable event. And, and uh, can you help me with that? Yeah. So um, certainly on your report form, you indicate how many times a week you use music. If it turns out that the music use is not, you know, it's it's less than weekly. And as you said, it's only a certain amount of times during the year. We do have a seasonal license rider or an occasional use rider that you can request that will accommodate uh, those businesses that aren't regularly using music. So that's something you just ask from the BMI rep. Say, hey, listen, I'm only using music several times a year. If you really are only, if you're doing only a couple of events a year, you may choose not to have what's called an eating and drinking establishment license, but a special event license, a festival license, which is good for, you know, a day or two. And um, it's a much less, lesser amount of money because it's not covering you annually. And it does have a, um, it does have a bit of a discount if you're doing it for a nonprofit, if for charity. Uh, it's a special events license. Um, now it's hard to do that skeeter if you're doing it 15 times a year, but if you're only doing it a couple times a year, that's something that may you may want to look into. Um, but we have again, we have a report form which you indicate how many times a week you're using various forms of music, and then we also again have this occasional mu music use or seasonal music use rider that you can request um, if you know if it's not a weekly occurrence. Okay, and then. Uh... You mentioned that uh, I know if we're a TRA member, then we could possibly get a 20% discount. But if we're using mood music, that discount doesn't come into play. Is that correct? That's correct, because mood, mood music is paying BMI on your behalf. Okay. okay. And actually, while we're on that, Dan, we've got a few questions that came in. Um, if you could just hit on sort of, you had a couple of slides that talked about Pandora and and Spotify, et cetera. But some of the others that were asked in the in the questions were, what about uh, Loop Media, uh, YouTube Music, or Vivo, um, or a Jukebox? Well, the Jukebox is covered. I saw the question. I think from Kyle, um, Jukebox is already pre licensed. So that's if that's the only music use you have, you don't have to enter into contracts with any of the performing rights organizations. Um, if you're just, again, I don't believe, I might be wrong. I don't know that YouTube has a license for businesses. Uh, so my, 
you know, my general rule of thumb is if you're using music, you've simply found yourself online through Vivo or YouTube and you're playing the audio from YouTube or Vivo and you didn't enter into any contract with any organization that represents them from a commercial standpoint, you need a license. That's the rule of thumb. I, I don't know whether YouTube is offering business uh, licenses for people that are interested in, in playing YouTube videos or, or, or music, but if you haven't entered into any formal contract with any organization representing the commercial rights of YouTube, um, then you would have to get a license yourself. Dan, a couple more questions in the chat. Uh, what about when a DJ is used? And then what if someone plays a piano in a 2300 square foot restaurant? So um, I'm going to go back. I think I saw that question. I want to, I want to make sure I read it again. Where is it? Yeah, it was. Uh, okay, I have a piano in my restaurant. If I, if I play sing live Desperado, do I owe a fee? Um, well, the business does. The business needs a license agreement. Um, if, if there's a piano in there, I mean, for example, Nordstrom's, right? You ever go to, no, I don't know if they have, they have a Nordstrom in Austin. Mm -hmm. Nordstrom's yeah. is, is very known for, they have a piano player that plays at Nordstrom's. That's licensable. So um, yeah, it, the thing about licensing is that it doesn't really matter where that music is coming from, whether it's coming from a piano, or it's coming from your personal playlist, it's coming from a band, it's coming from a, a DJ. That's all considered a public performance and it's, under the copyright law, it's always the responsibility of the business. I know sometimes the question I get is, well, I have a cover band coming in on Saturday night, you know, playing, you know, uh, nothing but uh, Jackson Brown songs. Why isn't that band responsible for paying Jackson Brown, the songwriter? Why am I? I don't have a better answer than it's what the copyright law says. It's just how they chose to to create the revenue stream, the income stream for the songwriters. They said that the business that uses that music, that benefits from that music, should bear the responsibility of compensating the writers and publishers. Fair point. And I, uh, one of the things that you've mentioned enough times and it just bears you know, re repeating is there's a difference between the, the, the artists who performed it, regardless of how large a star they are, and the person who wrote the song in, in your Kyle Park example, you've got someone who's a performer and a songwriter, but you've also yeah. got people who are just songwriters. Um, right. Take a look on the BMI website. You'll see there's a songwriter festival series um, that BMI does. And we've been in uh, ongoing conversations with them about there being one in Austin because Austin clearly has a very strong musical community. Uh, they do them in Maui. They do them in Key West, obviously Nashville. And so we'd love to bring one to Texas um, and BMI as a partners, uh, you know, we got ACL for the consumers, but songwriter festival is really an industry event. And it's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, we'd love to do something that we'd love to do something that, you know, that gives back to your members, because again, the hardest thing I think for your members to see is, you know, give back on our part, right? You know, it's, it's an intangible that they're paying for. It's, 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 it's hard for them to quantify. It's hard for them to get their arms around it. You know, I can't send them a widget in the mail and say, this is what you're paying for. So whenever we can do anything and partner with the association as a way to give back, you know, if we choose a time of the year in Austin where, you know, a lot of the bars and restaurants are empty, whether it's a hot time of year or whatever, or I don't know enough about the seasonal activity uh, in the Austin music economy, but, you know, we choose a time where, where bars and restaurants and hotels are, are, are hurting a little bit, like it's off season, and we try and you know, we try and, and bring business to, to the town. I just got back from Captiva Island, Florida, where we did exactly that down there, a songwriter festival that um, that brought uh, an economy a lot, a lot you know, to life during September when it's normally dead. Uh, by the way, my colleague, Brad, who happened to join this call, thank you, Brad, um, 34 years at BMI, I never can remember the number, 3,750 square feet for restaurants uh, or less playing a commercial radio station. That's where the exemption is. They don't need be. Uh, they don't need a license agreement for that. And for retail, it's two thousand or less. So thanks, Brad. I <laughs> one of these days I'll, I'll remember. Perfect. And I think you know, we 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 knew this would be a webinar that would be uh, popular, and and there are definitely a lot of questions. Um, I, I do want to kind of address one key thing first, and. Skeeter, your years in business, you've, you've probably seen every single kind of salesperson known to man and, and probably some innovative new approaches to sales that 
we'd all hope didn't exist. But the challenge of of collaborating, because some you know cases you get a letter in the mail, and sometimes you get the the collection phone call, right? Um, but with these four companies, what's your experience been in in just getting a hold of a person? Because I think that's the one thing is we're an industry of face to face conversations and hospitality and and communicating with each other. And that's one of the things we're promoting here is to have conversations with the companies. But how easy has it been, you know, for you when it comes to licensing for County Line to to get face to face with someone or even just on the phone with someone to have these conversations? Uh, because that might be an area where we can help facilitate. Well, I tell you, it's it's different with each group, whether it's you know ASCAP, CSAC. In this, I, I, we haven't dealt with this new company, but sometimes it's the the people that we deal with are extremely difficult, and and they're they're they have a hard time understanding what we're doing or what you know what kind of series we have or or what kind of music we're doing, and so that that part of it, and then getting to the bottom of how we're being charged, uh, it, it you know it always, uh, sorry Dan, but it always seems like a random amount. And so, you know, uh, at, at some point in time, I, I have to look at the music that I'm playing. Is it really still profitable for me for what I'm having to pay in, in fees, uh, you know, to continue to do it? So that's kind of been our experience. And sort of parallel to that is a question that was uh, posted. And I'm definitely not going to put you on the spot. It's, it's your, your role in BMI is to collaborate with all the state associations, but we, we have a very specific example that's been put forward, but it's sort of a hypothetical, but you know, if you've got capacity for 115, and let me just boil this down, make it simple. Let's say you have capacity of hundred seats, right? And, and you're open six days a week and you're just streaming in whatever local radio. It is, is there a formula that when you're talking with the member of the sales team, an operator can say, hey, just walk me through the formula so I can understand how you're calculating what I'm getting charged for? Okay, so the only thing that confused me about that question is, is, is the streaming music in. Um, again, trying oh, to get a, to get a better in. understanding of, I mean, piping, piping in, in music? Yeah, piping in the radio, local radio station. With what's the square feet of the bar restaurant? Is it more than three thousand seven hundred fifty square feet? Let's assume yes for the for the for the purpose of their question. Really, okay. So I think what you're asking is what's the what's what's the for someone who has a hundred and fifteen person occupancy, you know, what's the basic fee that someone might pay BMI for having music in their establishment? Maybe it's live music, you know, on Thursday nights. Maybe it's you know streaming their own personal Spotify account. Um, if Brad's still on the call, he can remind me of what the minimum fee is these days. It's somewhere around 400 and something bucks a year. Um, so if you were if you were starting up, this is what people ask me all the time. If I want to start a live music program, I've, I've never had it before. What kind of money am I looking at? And if they say, well, you know, my occupancy is about 100. You know, I'm going to play music a couple times a week with a singer songwriter. You know, I always say, well, if you add BMI and ASCAP together, maybe that's 800 collectively or 900, then you add a couple 300 or 200, 200 for CSAC. You know, it's, you know, $1,000 plus maybe a year. I, again, I'm just making this up for the, for the purpose of this conversation. I will say GMR, just to give you a little insight to GMR, they, they have not necessarily collectively gone after the entire industry. They've been very... Um, I don't know if it's calculated or 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 what whatever, but not everybody is telling me they've heard from GMR, right? And maybe you're in that same boat too. Not all members have heard from GMR, so um, that's definitely the the case. And uh, uh, Brad did chime in, and four hundred dollars is the minimum fee per year. Yeah. He also included a link, everybody, and we'll we'll include that in the uh, post of the recording of this webinar as well. But it takes you straight to BMI's licensing agreement. Page three is effectively a worksheet. That you could go through and fill out what you were planning to do in your business, whether it's live, whether it's piped in, et cetera. And based upon your occupancy, it's got a price per occupant per year that you can calculate that whole thing out. Yeah. So I would say my example of maybe less than a thousand dollars um is is about right. Um and you know, it's oh, look, it's we could have a we could have a whole webinar to talk about the ROI of live music, right? So some businesses Look at it nightly. Okay, I paid that guy 200. Uh, gee, I pay BMI, you know, 400 a year. I pay ASCAP 400 a year. You know, did I, 
did I make the kind of money that would justify live music? And then others just say it's a lost leader. It's part of my brand. I don't really think about it because it just helps promote who I am. Um, and uh, but but again, we have I will say, Skeeter, in terms of um, being responsive, we have a Brad is part of a very responsive licensing sales team. I would be very surprised if any of you called our licensing sales team and didn't get a live person on the phone. Um, that's what we pride ourselves on. If you have a customer relations issue, um, we will respond. I, I, I think that's what we do best. Um, you may not like paying those fees and some of you may even disagree with it. Um, but I'd like to think that we're gonna provide you the kind of customer service and education so that you at least understand what you're paying for and you get a response in a timely fashion. So, uh, well, I, sorry, go ahead. I think, you, I think you've educated me on, on, on why we pay the fees. I, uh, and I feel a lot better about it, but I, you know, I, I have to say, I, I don't like to have to pay the fees, but I understand. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I understand, but just know there are a lot of songwriters out there that are grateful and I, you guys don't see that, right? You don't hear that. You don't, you know, if you had songwriters that popped in every once in a while and said, Hey, you helped me, you know, put the food on the table last week, I appreciate you. But you don't because it's just it's this fee that you pay and it's not very humanized for you. It's just, you know, like I said, if, if, if you paid some, for something that was a little more tangible to you and not intellectual property, it might be easier if you'd have a better feeling for it and, and, and get a better uh, sense of where the money was going. Yeah, I will say you guys do a good job of putting a human face on it for the industry. You know, the, the, the SRAs that you've worked with um, and sorry, I use the, the acronym, but all the other state restaurant associations across the U.S. that also work with BMI, because this was a preferred partnership relationship that was originally brought in from the National Restaurant Association. Um, you, you give us the opportunity to see these songwriters, and I mean, that makes a big difference. And so we definitely want to keep pursuing doing something in Texas so that all of our members can have that same experience. A couple of the other questions that I think are really kind of important to hit on, because we've got you here. Um, yeah. So one, and, I'm, and I don't want to take an assumption on here, but I know I, I used to do this. Chris Baker is asking this question. I would be surprised if Skeeter's team does this as well, but either during setup time where you're just trying to ramp up the team and get them super excited or the guys in the kitchen are doing prep work in the afternoon. Essentially, the restaurant is not open to the public. You are just with your staff listening to some music to get everyone in a real good mood, keep the energy levels up. Is that private or is that public? Yes, that's private. I mean, it's all about the, int think about the intention, right? We sort of look at things from, from, from that standpoint. Is it if the intention, for example, let's say you're at a, a bar or restaurant, which would be unusual because most bars and restaurants have music to create ambiance, whether it's streamed in through a commercial music service or not. But let's say there's a radio that's playing, you know, it's a 5,000 square feet restaurant. It's a huge restaurant. And there's a radio playing in the kitchen for the staff, right? And that somehow ekes out into the main dining room. That's that's not licensable. That's a private performance for the for the staff out back. Um, that would not be something that you would find. Um, we would, I don't think any of the other organizations would pursue that. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Kyle also asks, so to make things easy and covering your bases is the best thing to do is use a mood media so you're covered for all music piped in if you do not have live music. Yeah, I mean, if, if you want to avoid having to deal with all the performing rights organizations, but you want some ambiance uh, in your uh, your restaurant, that is a simple way to do it. And that's, you know, in some of these commercial music services, I think offer decent monthly rates for that service. I'm not a, I'm not a salesman for commercial music services, but um, yeah, if you want to avoid the, the 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 issue of having the license with all the PROs, yeah, go with Mood Media and you're done. Definitely one way you can do it. Um, Ashton asks, I think it, it's uh, it's the flip side of the coin we haven't addressed yet, but what body enforces the copyright law? You know, who who's going to come after the operator that basically just says, "I don't believe in this, screw it, I'm not doing it." That's so BMI, ASCAP, CSAC, GMR. Um, we, um, we use a lot of information that we get from outside vendors as to who's just gotten a liquor license, or, um, we look at social media when you're promoting live music, 
so that we have a better understanding and appreciation for what you're doing. So when we call, we have a decent amount of market intel on, on, on what's going on at your establishment. So if the question is who's policing the copyrights, that's pretty much what we do. We, we make sure that if you are using music without a license, that, that uh, we rectify that. Um, you know, the downside of all this for businesses that ignore BMI or ASCAP or CSAC for that matter, they could get themselves into hot water because a copyright infringement lawsuit uh, in this space can be very costly and it's, it's really undefensible. In other words, the copyright law is pretty black and white. You know, it's not one of those things that you're going to have much success defending. <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty clear. I mean, I, my experience in the 30 plus years that I've been with BMI is that I don't, I can't think of any cases in recent years that have ever actually gone to court because, you know, if you have a business owner that doesn't really understand the copyright law, ignores all the performing rights organizations, they send them a cease and desist. Um, ultimately, it gets to a, a lawyer that the business has hired and the lawyer says, you need to settle with these guys and sign a license because it's just, it's black and white. They're you know, unless there's some strange extenuating circumstance that I'm not aware of, it's, it is, it is what it is. Well, that definitely helps. Um, I, I want to pivot from there back to the, the, the reminder to everybody that I think the, the, the theme of today's webinar and, and I very, very much appreciate Dan taking the time to, to walk us through all this is engage as much as you would get annoyed as all hell when you see some of those envelopes arrive in the mail because you don't believe that they're legitimate. And I think you know, global world music's a, a, an example of look at the list of who they're representing and, and what are you doing in your business, whether it's piped in, streaming, jukebox, or live, and, and, and act accordingly, but engage with them. Don't just ignore them. And I think that's probably the most important thing that's come out of this is, you know, it's one more vendor you got to work with, but if you work with them and get it set up and make sure everyone's clear on, on what you're doing, um, or take that option of the mood media or some other you know business class streaming service that takes care of it for you um but at the end of the day just don't ignore it uh, and, and if you also joe if you if, if any of you have any questions or concerns when you get a call from an organization um like a gmr or whomever and you're confused about it and what they're asking for um I, I would hope that joe would share my contact information with any member that would like it because Look, as I said before, these organizations do what we do. I respect them. They're trying to make sure songwriters are fairly compensated. But I also think that they operate in different ways than BMI does. And I just, I want to make sure that you understand that going into that conversation so that you don't feel like you're being taken advantage of. And they're aggressive, um, uh, how they go about it. And um, again, if they were on the call with me right now, I would, I would say, I respect what you're doing, but just... You know, I, I want them to, to, to be more mindful of some of the restaurants and bar owners are speaking with that don't understand the process. Right. And, um, you know, that's that's all I'm about is education. You're you're about engagement. I agree with that. I'm also about education because um, that's that's the most important thing is helping people understand what it is they're paying for. Where is the money going? And am I being treated fairly? Right. Absolutely. And that's why we appreciate you doing this for us. Um, I think we, we may have to do this again as a podcast. We're definitely going to post this yep. up on YouTube. Um, we, I think we can also put some of these materials on your BMI landing page on our website so that our members can get you know direct access to that on the regular. Uh, you are absolutely correct. Ben and I are happy to always connect you to any of our partners. Yep. Anytime any of you have a question or you're running into an issue, um, reach out to us. We'll, we'll happily connect you with Dan. Um, we'll include his contact info as well on the on the comments of the of the recording. Um, again, thank you, Dan, for taking the time to do this. I think we'll we'll wrap things up. Um, I appreciate everyone who stayed on the call, though we've gone a little bit over the usual hour we stick to with our webinars. Um, Skeeter, any last thoughts from you as we wrap up? Well, I mean, honestly, I I think if we have another one of these, it would be great because it's been an education for me, Dan, just to understand things rather than just being mad about it all the time. So, <laughs> wow. uh, you know, uh, it's it's been helpful and, and I'll get with our team and, uh, you know, we love having live music at the restaurant and and uh, and it is helpful. It, it's really we, we were the live music that we do do. 
uh, has provided over a million meals for those in need. So, you know, there's, wow. it's, it's a good thing. So wow. uh, I okay. certainly understand the songwriters need to be paid. So we appreciate your time. Well, congratulations to you for, for doing such great work. Um, and you know what, Joe, we'll leave it with this on something fun and exciting to talk about. I would love to have a conversation about doing some sort of a songwriter festival that allows us to give back in a tangible way to your membership. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's what I'm all, I'm always looking for that. I'm always looking for your membership to feel like they're getting a little love from BMI. And sometimes it's hard because of the nature of the business that we're in. You know, I can't send them music, right? I mean, it's a right. I can't send them a right as a thank you. So if I can send them a songwriter that will fill up the, the rafters on a, on an off night during a songwriter festival and sell a lot of food and beverage, then, then I did give something back or our songwriters did give back to a business that supported them. Yeah, I think you, we didn't really talk much about the, the, the logistics of the Songwriters Festival, but to give all of you uh, on the webinar an idea, um, the Key West Songwriters Festival effectively takes over the entirety of the town. Every bar or restaurant that you walk into over those three days has a songwriter performer in there showcasing what they do. And in some cases, I, I was personally very surprised at hearing some songs that I recognize as being from a popular artist and then I'm looking and I'm seeing this completely different person that's singing the song but it was the person who wrote it uh, and so it's a, it's a great experience and it's something we definitely want to bring to Texas so we'll keep talking about that to all of you who are on the webinar today thank you for your time thank you for your great questions um, we know there were even more we can always put you in direct contact with BMI so you can have those one-off conversations about your specific business but again just to reiterate you know learn about this understand the process engage with them, um, don't ignore them. Um, and, and we will do, always do our part as your association to do our best to make sure it's clear to everyone and, and happy to take any other feedback that you have and, and work with BMI and the others as well. So thank you all. Thank you uh, all. Ben, you. thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Skeeter. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate everyone. Take Skeeter, care. As always, thanks for being Skeeter, on. thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everybody. That was good.